some of, several of you, if not most of you, will have an opportunity perhaps to gather with your family and maybe have a cookout or do whatever it is you do in celebration of July the 4th. I know the last several years, uh, Ruth and the kids have all gathered in Georgia for fireworks at my son's church. They're not doing that this year, so I don't think they're all going to make that trip uh, on July the 4th. But it is a time when a lot of times families will get together and enjoy one another and have a good time. I heard a story where a set of great-grandparents were anticipating a large gathering at their home and they realized that the children, the grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren were all going to converge on their home and there was not going to be enough seating. So Ma said to Paul, we need to go to town and buy a sofa. So he agreed and they got in their car and they drove into town and went into the furniture store and they looked over the furnishings and Ma found a sofa that just kind of matched the rest of the furnishings in her home and she said, I really love this. What do you think about it, Paul? And he says, well, it does look good. And the eager salesman jumped in real quick and hey, by the way, today it's 25% off. And then Paul said, well, I think I really like it now. But as he was looking at it, he says, Ma, do you think it's big enough? Is it large enough? And the salesman, again, very eager to make a sale, spoke up and said, sir, this sofa will seat five people without any problems. And then Paul said, well, I guess now I know I don't need it. What do you mean? He said, there's not five people in my family who do not have problems. You'll get that by the time lunch gets here. You and I have a problem because we are a part of the human race. We have a problem, and that problem is a problem of sin. And it is common to all of humanity. The scripture makes that very, very clear to the point that it is beyond dispute. In my years as a believer and my years as a pastor, I've only met a handful of people, thankfully, who were unwilling to admit that they were sinners. Ironically, one of those who disputed with me as to whether or not he was a sinner was during a jail service. I was the visitor and he was the guest. And he debated with me that he was not a sinner. And I tried to help him see the truth of scripture and then I went home and he didn't. But by and large, most people are willing to admit that they're less than perfect, but we need to be even more specific than that, that we're sinners. And it's the presence of sin in our lives is what makes us less than perfect. We are sinners because we sin, and we sin because we're sinners. And this morning as we look at the problem that you and I have, I want us to look at the problem of sin. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4, that you'll find on the screen perhaps in a moment, 1 John 3 and verse 4, the scripture says in the King James Version, whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. In the ES ver ESV version, the same verse says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now you and I might say, wait a minute, I'm not a looter. I don't throw Molotov cocktails at police departments. I don't dance on the hoods of police cars. I'm not an insurrectionist or any of those things. How in the world can I be accused of lawlessness? Well, that word is a reference to God's law, God's word. It's not necessarily an accusation that you and I are breaking civil law our national laws, our state laws, or any of those kinds of things, it just simply 
proclaims the fact that all of us have sinned against the law of God. All of us. And if you think about it, literally to sin means to miss the mark. To miss the mark. It means that Christ is the standard by which all of us are to live. And I believe if we were to consider the life of Christ, it would make it easier for us to admit that we've missed his standard. When it comes time to making comparisons and to valuing ourselves, I think by human nature, we tend to pick people that we feel like that we're superior to. That uh, we can pick some person who's committed some egregious sin, who's done some dastardly deed and say, I have never done that. I have never been that low. And it makes us feel better about ourselves. But scripture is clear, we're not to compare ourselves one with another. That your neighbor is not your standard. You will not be measured by your neighbor or by some foreign citizen halfway around the world. You and I are measured by the word of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the word made flesh and he is the standard by which all of us will be judged. And when that is taken into consideration, I have to say, woe is me. I have to admit that yes, Lord, I am a sinner and in need of your grace and in your, of your forgiveness. Sin, anything that misses the holy mark of God, that violates the standard of God, anything that goes against that which is right and holy, anything that goes against the word of God. Now, what is the origin of sin? Where did it all come from? You and I, we are, as Americans, we get to enjoy the, the technological advances of those that have come before us. We're able to stand on the shoulders of our founding fathers and to be able to enjoy the most prosperous nation to ever exist. This is it, the most prosperous nation to ever exist and no doubt the reason that we are that is because of the political system that our founding fathers gave us and also because of the blessing of God. They gave us a system that allows people to be the freest that they could be in comparison to any other systems in America, any other systems in the world. And they've allowed us to prosper and many of our founding fathers, not all, but many of them were Bible believing Christians. And many of our earliest laws, when they were written down, were written down with a notation with a Bible verse beside it. Chapter and verse. And those of you that have toured D.C. very closely and looked very closely, many of those buildings that have been around for many, many, many decades, you will find scripture verses engraved on the walls of our nation's capital. It's amazing the first public school system in the United States was founded in the state of Massachusetts or the colony of Massachusetts at that time. And it was done so under something called the Old Satan Deluder Act. The Old Satan Deluder Act. Once a town reached a certain population, they wanted at public expense public schools to be founded so that children could be taught to read the Bible so that their minds would not be deluded by Satan. That was the motivation for creating public schools, to teach children the ability to read the Word of God. Harvard, our nation's oldest university, founded in the 1600s, was originally founded to train ministers to be able to be pastors and to teach the word of God. And I dare say today, Harvard would be among our most liberal institutions. It would be one of those that's very anti-God and et cetera. But I am thankful for our founding fathers and the heritage that they have given us the freedoms that we enjoy and how that has led to great prosperity and great power. But here in Isaiah chapter 14, we see an origin of something else. And it's the origin of sin. 
I like to know where things come from. Well, where did sin come from? Here in Isaiah chapter 14, beginning with verse number 12, the scripture says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation and in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Lucifer, somewhat of an unfamiliar name, it we believe to be the name of Satan before his fall. Lucifer is believed to be one of God's holy angels, perhaps an archangel. Matter of fact, there are only three angels named in scripture by name, Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer. And then Lucifer was overcome with pride. He was not content to be who he was designed to be. That sound familiar, 2024? Men want to be women, women want to be men. He was not content to be whom God had designed him to be and overcome in pride, he said, I will be like the most high. And then in verse 15, it says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. It was there we find the origins of sin the origins of evil. And then Satan, as he was renamed, which means adversary, he met Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Yes, I believe in creation. I do not believe in evolution. I do not believe that we come from other organisms. I believe that humanity is made in the image and likeness of God. And Adam and Eve, our parents, the first couple, to walk the face of this earth, met up with Satan in the form of a serpent and he tempted them. He tempted them. Eve was deceived, but Adam willfully sinned. He was aware of the consequences that Eve was to experience and he willfully chose to follow his wife in rebellion to God. Now what happened there? in that beautiful garden, in paradise. Well, Satan began to get, he began to plant the seeds of doubt in the mind of Eve regarding the word of God. He began to to help her, to encourage her to question, was the word of God really so? That happens still today. Is the creation story factually true? Is Jesus really the only way to heaven? Is there such a thing as a lake of fire and eternal damnation? There are people who question these things and they're very basic things that are in the word of God that I believe and that you ought to believe because it is God's word. But here's what Satan did then and he does now is he plants seeds of doubt. And then eventually, as he progressed in his conversation, as he progressed in his temptation, he went so far as to simply deny the word of God. You shall surely not die. In direct conflict with the words of God, Eve, you will not die if you disobey God and partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. He denied the word of God. And then Adam willfully, knowing what had transpired in the life of Eve, took the fruit as well. And the consequence was sin was introduced into humanity. Sin and death was introduced into the human race. And then if you know your Bible, you know your Genesis, the first book of the Bible pretty well, you'll know that Adam and Eve, common sense, mother of, father of all the living, But as they produced children over a very, very long lifespan, 
Two of those children were brothers by the names of Cain and Abel. And Adam and Eve did as you and I do. We do our best to raise our children. We try to teach them right and wrong. Sometimes they please us. Sometimes they hurt us. Sometimes they make us very proud. Sometimes they disappoint us. And as Adam and Eve raised these boys up to grown men, Abel apparently had learned to worship God. He had embraced the teaching of his mother and father. He had embraced the true and living God, but Cain wanted to do things his way. Cain wanted just enough God to try to soothe his conscience. He wanted just enough of God that he could sleep at night, but not so much of God that he would live a responsible, godly life. And ultimately what Cain did, and this is something that blows my mind, he killed his own brother. Now I have one sibling, and when we were younger, we, we could have World War III. We could have pine cone fights, rock fights, switch fights, sword fights, boxing. I don't know, my parents bought boxing gloves one year for Christmas for us. And we about beat each other silly with boxing gloves. I mean, just wear each other out. But I can't imagine taking my own brother's life. Even in all those wars we had as little guys, I loved him and he loved me and today we love each other and are very close as grown men, but Cain murdered his brother. He shed his brother's blood. Can you imagine what went through the heart of Adam and Eve when they had one son kill another son? Folks, that's, that's the fruit of sin. Now obviously, not everyone has sin with consequences that are as grave as that in this life. But we do know that the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We do know the Bible says in Isaiah 59 and verse two that your iniquities have separated you between you and your God. And that is a fact for all of us None of us are born into this world with salvation. We're not born into this world as Christians. We're not born into this world as little Baptists or little Methodists or little anything except little cutie pies or not heads. That's why Jesus spoke to a very powerful man and a very religious man in John chapter three and he said to Nicodemus, who was a man that was spiritual. He was a man that, thought about God and considered God and, and had some knowledge of the Old Testament and Christ said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. You must be saved. And it kind of went over his head. And Nicodemus said, I'm a grown man. How, how can I enter into my, my mother's womb a second time and be born again? He was thinking about the natural and the physical, but Christ was speaking that you need to be born from above. You need to experience a spiritual birth. Now, if Nicodemus was not prepared to meet God as a deeply religious man and as a man who was knowledgeable in the Old Testament, how in the world could I have ever claimed no need of salvation? And even though I probably claimed that, I could not claim that truthfully or accurately. I needed salvation. So we see here the, the origin of sin. The Bible says in Romans 5 and verse 12, and this is one among one of my many favorite verses. Romans 5 and 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that's Adam, and death by sin, every graveyard is a testimony to the truth of the scripture. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. You and I have a problem because we're human beings. 
But we not only see the problem of sin in Scripture, we also see the provision of salvation. We have such a loving, wonderful God who's not only holy and just and righteous and has to deal with sin, but the Scripture also says that He is a God of love. And because He is a God of love, He makes a way that you and I might be able to avoid eternal damnation, to avoid the lake of fire, to avoid eternal death. And that way is through the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, I quoted one of these verses, I think during Bible school or perhaps even last Sunday, I can't recall. But in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, some beautiful scripture. Matter of fact, I have verse 8 highlighted in my Bible with a nice bright yellow highlighter. We're looking now at the provision of salvation. It says, but God commended or demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we, be, we shall be saved from wrath through him. As I've shared with you numerous times, my family, and I'm talking about generations of my family, we were what you would call unchurched. We didn't attend church. We didn't attend church at Easter. We didn't attend church at Christmas. We didn't attend church at Mother's Day. We didn't go to church. The only times we'd darken the doors of a church would be to attend a funeral. That was the extent. It was that way for my grandparents. It was that way for my parents, my uncles and my aunts. It was that way for me and my brother and my cousins. We were just a totally unchurched or close to totally unchurched family. But even while we were walking in darkness and in ignorance, Christ had already demonstrated his love for my family, generations of my family, and for the world by going to the cross 2,000 years ago. Christ went to the cross of Calvary as the Son of God and as God the Son, God in the flesh, and took upon himself the penalty for your sins and my sins. And by having faith and trust in that great redemptive work and by having true repentance where we turn from sin to Christ and inviting him to be the Lord of our lives, we can have forgiveness. We can be saved. Now the question always has been, saved from what? And I remember that so vividly when I come to faith in Christ. Stepping in a little country church so many, many years ago, back in 1982, a little bitty country community that had a railroad track, a country store, and a church. A little bitty community called Osierfield. I stepped into a little country church that I'd often ridden by on Sunday mornings, going from a pond or to a pond to fish. And as I would ride by that church in the back, my uncle would be the driver and I'd be sitting in the back, stare out that glass and look at all the cars in the parking lot parked under those big old long, tall Georgia pine. I would think in my mind, I wonder why they do that. They could have been fishing. I wonder why they sit there on this beautiful day and listen to people talk as opposed to fishing and doing what I've done. But then one day, as my little family of four, our family was going through major upheaval and it was falling completely apart and I was grasping for some kind of help and I received an invitation to attend that same little church and I said, why not? Things are as bad as they can get, or at least I thought. And I thought that if I walked into that little church that maybe over a few times, few days, few weeks that God would fix everything and then I could get back out there to catch in the bass and the catfish. 
But when I stepped into that church, I heard things I had never heard before. I heard the gospel. I heard that there's a heaven to gain and there's a hell to shun. I heard that you don't go to heaven by being good and you don't go to hell because you're bad. That blew my mind. I always thought good people went to heaven. Bad people went to hell. And you know what I thought I was. I thought I was good. Because I literally compared myself to people who I thought were in worse shape than me. Therefore, I had to be good. But I heard the gospel. I heard the gospel. That Jesus left heaven, took upon himself human flesh in Bethlehem and lay in that manger and he grew up into manhood and he preached that he was the way, the truth, and the life and that no man can come to the Father but through Jesus and that he preached that I am the door to salvation and the only way to get to any place is through the door if you're going to go properly and legitimately. And I heard that, that Christ loves sinners. And when I had my eyes open to the fact that I was a sinner, that, that, that caused me some trouble there. I'll tell you, that troubled me. I went home at night and it troubled me as I thought about what I had heard. But then I heard also that preacher say that Jesus loves sinners. And that made my ears perk up. And that if Christ died in my place, that there was no need for me to have to die and go to hell that I simply needed to trust him as my Lord and my Savior. The Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 16, listen carefully, one of the most quoted verses, if not the most quoted verse in all of Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I found out in that little country church that I could be a whosoever. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I heard Ephesians 2 and 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I learned that I couldn't earn my salvation. I learned that I couldn't be good enough. I couldn't be moral enough. I couldn't work for it enough. I couldn't have the right last name. I learned that salvation is a gift of God and in order to receive a gift of any kind, you have to be willing to accept it. You have to be willing to accept it and there's a lot of people who go through life just never accepting Christ. They may have some head knowledge, but you far ahead of me at that time, I had no head knowledge, but they go through life perhaps with some head knowledge, maybe some memory of attending a Christmas cantata, or perhaps having heard uh, the Christmas story read at a tender age, and you still have some recollection of that. But you've never reached the point where you want Jesus to be your Lord, to be your Savior. I want to encourage you to do that today and to trust Christ as your savior. As we move from the problem of sin and the provision of salvation, I want you to consider the promise of salvation. Again, among some of my favorite verses in Bible, and there's many of them in the Gospel of John. Oh, I love the Gospel of John. You ought to read through the book of John. But in John chapter 10, verses 28 through 29, 28 and 29, here's what the, the Lord said. The Lord Jesus said, and I give unto them eternal life. Speaking to those that would be his disciples, speaking about those who would believe in him. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, for my Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Wow, what comforting verses. Listen, John 10, 28 and 29 is a promise from the Lord Jesus Christ that for those who come to him in faith, he gives eternal life. 
Not conditional life, not temporary life, not life that can be repossessed, withdrawn and taken away, not life that will, he will tend to forget. But Christ said, those who come to me, I will give eternal life, not eternal damnation. Those verses get me excited. And then in the same book of the Bible, in John chapter 14, we look this week in VBS. All of our classes, I think, probably studied John 14. At some point this week, Christ said to his disciples, after he had given them some bad news, and all of you of any age have had some bad news given to you at some point. It may have been in relation to some loved ones. It may have been your financial situation, your health. It may be the passing of someone who was very dear and precious to you. All of us have had some bad news delivered to us. Well, the disciples had been given a series of messages from the Lord that was discouraging. Now, he was telling them the truth, but sometimes the truth hurts. Here's what the Lord told his disciples preceding John 14. He told them about five times, I'm leaving and you can't go with me. They had spent three years with him. They had, they had heard the best teaching mankind had ever known. He's the master teacher. They had witnessed miracles. And then for, after three years, Christ says, I'm going away, but you can't come with me. And he meant at that time. And that troubled them. Our dear friend is taken from us. Our Lord is being taken from us. And then he went a step further and he said, one of you dear friends are going to betray me. That really rocked their world. Because when he shared that, they looked at one another and they had confidence in one another. Matter of fact, the one that betrayed them, they may have trusted him more than any in the group. He was the treasurer. Judas Iscariot was the keeper of the money. They had a tremendous amount of confidence and trust in him, but he would be the one who would betray the Lord Jesus Christ and sell him over for 30 pieces of silver. And then off the top of that, y'all remember the Apostle Peter in Scripture? The Apostle Peter was a man's man. He was a leader of men. He could, just, he could get people to jump off a cliff with him if he was gonna jump off a cliff. He was the spokesman of the apostles. He was a part of our Lord's inner circle. You would often find Peter, James, and John going away in seclusion to get very close with Christ and get some additional teaching and instruction and those kinds of things. And the Lord looked at Peter and said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times this very night. Oh, they were shaken. Stay with me, I'm about to wind down. They were shaken. So all of this had been delivered to them and I would imagine the apostles probably if they had picked up pencil and paper, they probably could have written a number one blues hit because they were singing the blues after all of this information. And then Christ says this in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Five times, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. Christ says, here's what I'm gonna be doing. I'm going to prepare a place for you in glory. Verse three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. You know what the Lord did? He said, I'm going to the Father's house. I'm going to glory. I'm going to heaven. And I'm gonna prepare a place for those of you who are mine. And if I go away, one day I will come again and receive you unto myself. One day the Lord Jesus is coming back. He's not coming back for everybody. He's coming back for those that are his. When you showed up at the school pickup line, you didn't say, give me 300 of them. You said, where are mine? When the Lord Jesus comes back, he's not coming back for eight billion people. He's coming back for the children of God. He's coming back for those that are his. Let me ask you the question. Are you one of his? Have you been born again? Have you trusted Christ as your savior? 
Have you asked him to be your Lord? If you have, you know what you ought to do? You ought to confess that before people. The Lord Jesus said that if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father who's in heaven. That's what Scripture says. God doesn't need undercover Christians. He needs spirit-filled witnesses, people that will boldly proclaim, I belong to Christ. I love my Lord. So if you've been saved, you ought to walk an aisle and say, Preacher, I want to I I say so. But if you haven't been saved, you ought to walk an aisle and say, I need to be and I want to be right now. And if you'll do that, I'll pray with you and the Lord will show you what salvation is and God will save you. I can't save you, but the Lord Jesus can. Will you mind God, Brother Thad, come lead us? Just mind the Lord. Thank you.